Even as they were securing their freedom from Britain, Americans were also struggling to define a new type of government. The conflict with Britain had left Americans with an aversion to giving government too much power, and an inclination to give people a greater voice. The increasing power of democratic ideals was reflected in the character of the state governments created during and after the war. Ten of the states quickly adopted written constitutions which clearly defined the powers of government and the limits of those powers, including six states which created very specific bills of rights. Many also severely weakened the power of the elected executive. Typically, state governors lack the authority to veto legislation or to dismiss the legislature. At the same time, many states greatly enhanced the power of the elected lower houses. The most radical example of this was in Pennsylvania, which developed a single all-powerful legislative assembly with no executive and no upper house. It reflected the belief that the electorate could be trusted to exercise power without any significant checks or balances, although there remained significant limitations upon who actually exercised the franchise. Groups such as women, African Americans, and Native Americans had no political voice, while eligibility to vote was still based upon ownership of property. This period also saw the creation of a central government, but it remained extraordinarily weak. Under the Articles of Confederation, the national government had no executive or judiciary, no power of taxation, and no power to regulate foreign trade. In essence, the United States was simply a confederation of independent states, only loosely tied together as a single nation. The weaknesses of this system quickly became apparent. The war had left the national government with huge debts. Congress had printed lots of currency, and had also borrowed a lot of money to promise to pay it back. But with no ability to levy taxes, how could they? They could only request funds from the states, but this didn't work very well. The states had their own debt problems, since they had also spent a lot of money during the war, and they proved reluctant to contribute to the federal government. The only significant source of revenue open to the new government was from the sale of western lands. Thomas Jefferson had proposed an idealistic plan to give away these lands to encourage the growth of a republican society where property and economic opportunity was available to all. His ideals, however, were trumped by the urgent need of the government for cash. The Land Act of 1785 authorized the sale of these lands with a minimum purchase amount of 640 acres, one square mile, at a minimum price of a dollar an acre. Under these provisions, it was very difficult for ordinary farmers to afford to buy their land directly from the government. Instead, most of the land offered was snatched up by speculators, who profited by reselling it in small parcels to farmers. In 1787, Congress further organized the West by passing the Northwest Ordinance, which established the procedures for the creation of local governments in the territories. Under its provisions, Congress appointed governors to rule the territories until such time as there was enough population to elect popular assemblies, and ultimately to create new state governments. This measure ensured that newly settled areas would not simply be colonial dependencies of the already established states of the East, and that its people would enjoy the full benefits of Republican government. The ordinance was also significant in that it prohibited slavery in territories north of the Ohio River but left it open to the South, thus helping to create the North-South divide that would characterize the country's growth for decades to follow. The Confederation Congress had successfully created mechanisms for settling the West, but it proved feeble in actually helping its citizens to establish themselves there. Some of these problems related to conflicts with foreign governments. The British, for instance, proved reluctant to actually abandon their military outposts in the Northwest. They continued to main troops there, in violation of the 1783 Peace Accord, and secretly encouraged Native tribes to resist American expansion. Spain, which controlled the territory west of the Mississippi, likewise subsidized Native tribes hostile to the United States, and threatened to close off navigation of the Mississippi itself. Without this key transportation route, Settlers in the Northwest had little access to trade. The native peoples of the region, encouraged by Britain and Spain, acted vigorously to keep American settlers out. 
By 1786, the Creek had resumed hostilities in the backcountry of Georgia, while north of the Ohio River, tribes such as the Shawnee, Delaware, and Miami moved to create a military coalition, which launched raids upon settlements in the Northwest. The Confederation Congress, with barely enough money to pay for its own operation, had no funding to spare to raise an army which could respond to these events. The Confederation also proved unable to negotiate with foreign governments in other matters. The colonies had been part of the British mercantile system, which meant that they had the protection of the British Navy, and British ports were open to them. But with independence, this changed. The New Republic had no leverage to open up foreign ports to American commerce, particularly since it lacked its own navy. The closing of the British West Indies to American trade was a particularly severe blow to American mercantile interests. The new government likewise had little ability to regulate internal commerce or to provide for a stable currency, which compounded the economic chaos of the post-war era. By the late 1780s, many people, particularly social elites, were discouraged by the lack of order and the weaknesses of the central government. They were alarmed by signs of continued social unrest. The premier example of this was Shays' Rebellion. Like most of the states, Massachusetts had serious economic problems following the Revolution. Many ordinary people found themselves deeply in debt and in danger of losing their farms and homes. This led to demands for the expansion of cheap paper money to water down the debts owed, and stay laws which would prevent creditors from seizing the assets of debtors. Several of the states had passed these laws, but Massachusetts was dominated by a physically conservative upper house with veto power over the popularly elected lower house. In effect, this gave enormous influence to the merchants and financiers in places like Boston, who demanded that all debts, public and private, be paid in full with hard money, not paper. By 1786, Sheriffs in the western portion of the state were regularly foreclosing on farms and even throwing debtors into prison. Pleas for relief were ignored, and as more and more defaulting farmers were hauled into court, groups of armed men began to march on county courthouses to shut them down. Led by Daniel Shays, a distinguished Revolutionary War veteran, about 2,500 men in three western counties took up arms to resist the taxes the government was levying against them. The resistance sparked a quick response from conservative interests, and the governor sent 4,000 troops to suppress the rebellion. The cost of raising this small army was covered by wealthy citizens, in particular the Boston mercantile elite. The rebels, the rebels were ultimately dispersed with little violence, although many were punished by being barred from ever again voting or holding office. Shays' rebellion had been quickly suppressed, but it represented for many people an alarming trend in the country. Some of the old revolutionary elites began to argue that popular democracy was getting out of hand. Ben Franklin, for instance, would comment in 1789 that, quote, We have been guarding against an evil that old states were most liable to, excess of power in the rulers, but our present danger seems to be defect of obedience in the subjects, unquote. George Washington likewise argued that, quote, We have probably had too good opinion of human nature. Experience has taught us that men will not adopt and carry into execution measures the best calculated for their own good without the intervention of a course of power. Unquote. These fears, combined with the many apparent defects of the Articles of Confederation, led for calls to revise this document. 